I'm going to talk a little bit about how to make dynamic languages work in a parallel environment. So the title of my talk is how to go from broken um, or slow to safe and efficient. And I'm going to tell you just in a bit what that means. Before that, um, that's of course work that has been done with a couple of people here, just the two most important ones uh, to mention. So Benoit on the left, he was a PhD student at JKU, and he is now actually at Oracle Labs, and Oracle Labs also um, funded some of that research through him. So thank you, Oracle. Um, on the right, we have Ari Tal, who joined a little bit later. Um, he brought actually some crucial component to the whole project, a layout lock, and I'm going to tell you just a little bit about that later. So um, that work has been going on for a while, three, four years now. By now, I'm at the University of Kent at a very nice programming languages and systems group, and I'm a lecturer there. And generally, I have been working for, I think, the last 12 years on language implementation on virtual machines, and that's some of the stuff we did. If you guys got a question, I have that slide. I'm not sure whether the student volunteers will hate me for that, but uh, please feel free to ask questions. OK, so what do I do mean with dynamic languages? Here are just a couple of those on the slide. There's a whole wide variety of dynamic languages we could be talking about. So here on the right, you have languages that, when it comes to concurrency and parallelism, are really well behaved. So you have Clojure, Alexia, Erlang, and R. And those are languages which don't usually use mut mutation. So parallelism is not really a problem for them. In the middle, you have a set of languages. Most of the implementations don't actually have shared memory. So if you have parallelism there, that's typically done in separate heaps. And there, you don't really have the kind of problems I'm going to talk about. And then on the left, you have languages where essentially everything is broken when it comes to parallelism. And there are multiple reasons for that. Some just use a global interpreter lock, like, for instance, Ruby and Python. I'm not too sure what Perl does, but I think as well. So here, this broken, I mean, it's just slow. It's not actually parallel. So what can we do about that? So um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about the basics as well. So let's start with a little bit of data representation in a dynamic language. I will use JavaScript as syntax, but the work has been done mostly on Ruby. Um, but I thought JavaScript may be more familiar. So here we define an array. We can, of course, put anything we want into that array because it's a dynamic language. There is nobody that checks on us. And maybe there is some good reason why we would do that. So the other thing we can do is just extend the array arbitrarily. So if you think a bit about parallelism and multiple threads doing that, you may see that there might be a problem. So, but uh, in typical dynamic language implementations, especially in Python and C Python and in Ruby and MRI, things like that would be represented very generically, very in a uniform way so that the interpreters don't have to do too much work to actually make that work. So what we see here is an array representation that essentially just points to the various objects in it. And even the numbers are wrapped into boxes. So everything is an object, and the uniform representation allows for a very nice and clean implementation, but comes as an overhead, for instance, here, as extra memory use for numbers, or if you would want to add numbers, you have to do extra operations. So the interesting bit here is that full power of actually stuffing all kinds of different objects and types into the same array is really rarely used. Think about iterating over that area. What could we do with it? Not a lot. So most code we find out there doesn't actually look like that. So what we more see is arrays that actually are pretty homogeneous. So you have an array with floating point numbers, an array with objects, or just an array with integers up here. So, and that's work that has been done by other people and that started to be used first in PyPy, I believe, and later on in JavaScript VMs. Uh, like V8. So because these things are homogeneous, we can actually represent um, the values in memory as if they would be raw integers. Instead of having a simple array object with just a bunch of pointers, 
we now have an array object that points to a strategy. And that strategy defines how we can access, actually access raw memory. So the operation of accessing a specific index of an array would go through that strategy and then decide what to do. And in the case of such an integer array, we would represent all the integers in raw memory, like you would do in the C program, for instance. And then that access would simply read from that raw memory and read the 64 bits or 32 bits of your integer and can directly work with that. The same thing you can do with floating point numbers. And here you see the important bit. It uses a different strategy so that we know that we have to read that memory as floating points. Of course, if you then start mixing things again or just have objects, customer objects or something like that, um, we would use what we saw previously, the generic representation of just having an array of pointers that points to the various objects. So that's then itself an extra strategy. And yeah, Lars? So, the, yeah, thank you. I will then repeat the question. If you have a compact way of storing doubles or integers in the array, you then have this problem when you extract a value, you have to box it if you pass it along in the program. Why is this not a problem? So, if you have an unboxed representation and take the objects out, and indeed we have to box it, um, that's typically not a problem in the systems where these kind of strategies are used because they would be applied mostly in just-in-time compiling systems. So I haven't actually seen a system where you have a pure interpreter. So in the, in the context of a loop, for instance, where you go over these arrays, you would avoid the boxing. You take the integer out, you use it immediately for the computation, and then you possibly store it back into because you have in the compilation unit um, the chance to avoid the actual allocation of the boxing object by applying the just-in-time compilation. In a pure interpreter, indeed, yes, um, you could introduce extra overhead by producing more boxed objects. And if you saw the talk about Truffle, um, in these kind of systems where you run in, in the interpreted mode, you have more overhead for boxing, indeed. Yeah, so that would be a problem. But uh, most of the systems I know where that's applied, you assume that when that kicks in, you will also reach compiled code and avoid the boxing overhead. Does it answer your question? Yeah. OK, good. So just a little bit more background on that. Um, actually, that idea is derived from objects and how objects are treated. And that's something very old. So that comes actually from self. Um, people figured out that actually even if you have these kind of very dynamic object systems, here is it's JavaScript, originally it was self, where you just create an object and then gradually create fields of the object, so ex essentially extend the object as extra state and then put random pieces of data in there that you can figure out that actually that doesn't happen all the time and there are not that much variations in the data. Um, so in the most basic representation, as you find, for instance, in MRI or even PHP, you would have objects represented as a hash table to get that dynamicity represented easily in the interpreter. So instead of having, for instance, bar stored directly in memory, you would again do a hash on the name of the field and then look up that value. And as you can see here, in the worst case, you may even need to traverse a chain to access a field. So that's fairly inefficient. But as I said, in cell, they figured out that's rarely used. So the full generality of the dynamic languages is not actually how we write programs, because we probably couldn't even understand it if we would make them too dynamic. So instead, um, they came up with the notion of a map, a mapping from a specific slot of an object, a specific, specific field, to um, what it actually contains. So here you have the object representation now with a map or hidden class. And you point to that kind of 
metadata. So for the arrays, we had a strategy. Here we call it a shape, and that shape says, okay, in slot one, we actually f store foo, and we extra also have that additional bit of information that we actually store an integer here, so that we know, okay, we can read that 33. And that helps, especially in the context of just-in-time compiling virtual machines, to highly optimize the code. So now the question is, how do languages behave, especially in a parallel context as that? Let's start with a simple sequential program. So we create an array, then we store at index 2 an object, at index 9 we store a double. So initially we have just an integer array, and then we store all kind of other stuff. So when we print that, would we expect the obvious result here? And with obvious results, I mean uh, we store the two um, objects into the array, and then it would just print out the changed um, array with these changes. So who would expect the obvious result? And that's kind of a trick question. I want to see all arms. Yeah, good. So we would expect something like that. So at slot two, because we start from zero, um, we have the object, and then we have the 42 up there. Now let's add a second thread. So our array at index two is storing, or the thread one is storing the object, and thread two is storing the 42. So remember, I told you about these strategies and that we can optimize the representation of the array. And now the question is, should that print here print the same thing as we saw on the slide before? OK. For the ones who don't have the arm up, what should it print otherwise? Should it pr really print something different? Well, well, sometimes it might be that one of the updates is lost. Uh, but sometimes it might be the correct thing. Yeah, so we might lose updates. But should it lo lose updates? <laughs> no. Exactly. Yes. So it should always give the correct answer as before, even if you have two threads. The reasoning for that, at least from my perspective, is we have two entirely separate indices into the array. So there is not actually a race condition as we would define it in a classic um, computer science way. So it's not actually the same storage location that's affected at least from the language level. So, but indeed, in most implementations that do that kind of optimization, we would see, for instance, here, these two cases. So in that case, the first thread won, and we lost an update here. And here, in that case, the second thread won, had actually converted, because we are talking here about JavaScript, which mostly has doubles, uh, except when they sheet for optimization purposes, converts everything into a double, and in that process, loses the other update. But from a programmer perspective, that's kind of what the hell is going on. And from a language designer perspective, I would argue that's a bug and that should never be exposed to the program. OK, so but what do actual um, implementations do? Well, they don't do much. We see actually these things. So the mo main reason is that single core performance would be affected by all the ideas uh, they could come up with. So, we are going to look into that in a second. Single core performance of, is, of course, important. For instance, in uh, Python, I believe, one of the main reasons why they still have the global interpreter log is because removing that would reduce single core performance. Second thing is people argue you would need application level synchronization anyway. But I think I just showed you an example where there doesn't seem to be any need for application level synchronization. So that doesn't seem to make sense to me as an argument. So we need to find something better. And even if we would do, for instance, something like synchronized here in Java style of the array at the implementation level, we wouldn't actually get any benefit from the parallelization. So in that case, we would just synchronize the whole array, and we would ne never actually have parallel execution on that array. So it would also be kind of just a weakly better version than a global interpreter lock. OK, so let's see what we can do. 
Um, before that, let me just try to motivate in the context because we did that Ruby uh, work in Ruby in the context of Ruby. Why people actually might care about that? And here we took a piece of Ruby code a colleague wrote. Um, it's about sorting or creating an index for simple um, search of data. The idea is we create a hash map and that hash map if we access something that doesn't actually have yet any entry, we'll create a list. So that means whenever we access a slot or a key in that hash map, we get an empty list or a list that already has data items. And then we create n threads. We iterate over those. For each of these n threads, we create a new one that will iterate over a range of numbers. So the idea is we split up a large array logically into chunks of k elements and each thread accesses a chunk that doesn't isn't accessed by any other thread reads that data and then puts it directly into a hash map and here we use essentially the index of the data in that large array as an element so in the end we get a hash map with a list of indices into our data to easily find um, what we were looking for. So in C Ruby, that's perfectly safe. And C Ruby kind of defines the language. So I think there is a bit of a standard, but most of the language is really defined by the implementation. And in that language implementation, that's done almost in parallel, minus the global interpreter lock, and it's perfectly safe. So every standard Ruby implementer or every standard Ruby programmer would assume that program just to do what it says on the slide. It creates you a nice map um, that you can use for fast searches, lookups. And it's safe. So, but if you have these kind of strategies, that would just crash at some point. Uh, because here we would create an array, and then at some point we may change the representation, we may need to extend the array, all these kind of things, and that would be terribly unsafe in implementations, for instance, like JRuby. You had a question? So the question so is whether, yeah. So it means uh, CRuby does not use storage strategies? Is that true? CRuby does not use storage strategies. And it also doesn't have parallelism. So it actually doesn't have the problem. Even if it would use storage strategies, it wouldn't have the problem because it uses the global interpreter lock which means only one thread at a time can access it. But implementations like JRuby, they don't have a global interpreter lock. And if you have storage strategies in there, um, then it would just crash. Jiten, as a Python, um, they also don't have a global interpreter lock. Um, they actually lock on the collections to prevent these kind of issues. OK, but that kind of locking global interpreter locks is really bad for performance, so we want to do something about it. So let's look at single core performance first, because that's the main barrier for adoption for these kind of techniques. Nobody wants to have their old programs run slower. So yeah. Um, our solution to that is to represent objects in different ways, depending whether they can be accessed by one or multiple threads. So here, visualized with two colors, on the right-hand side, we have blue objects that are reachable here, these squiggly lines are supposed to be threads, so there are at least four threads that can access them. And we have a global um, route that kind of points to one of the objects. So that means anywhere in your program, you can access perhaps via global any of these objects. And then we, here on the left-hand side, we have the white objects. Those are local to a single thread. So that means it might be the local variable you have on your stack, the local variables you're just using for your computations. So no other thread can reach them because there is just no pointer in that direction. So all these pointers here only point to the blue objects. You never have a pointer from a blue object to a white object. So, um, and the way we represent it in our implementation is we actually extend the notion of a shape with an extra bit of information. So we have two types of shapes to access these objects, the white shapes, are the ones local to a single object. And that means we know if we access any of these slots, 
then we don't have to think about synchronization at all. For the blue objects, those are now synchronized. And if we would, for instance, change the shape of an object, then we start have to synchronize. And that means we have to think a little bit harder how we can read and access fields for these objects. But I'm not going to go into detail for that. I'm concentrating on the, the array part. So the important bit is, once an object or before an object becomes reachable by other threads, we will change its shape. So that means in these implementations that use these kind of tricks like hidden classes, we can already use the existing mechanisms to change the way we access these objects or arrays. So that means if we, for instance, would want to add a pointer here from that blue array to that array by storing, for instance, the reference of the white array into the blue one, uh, we first have to flip all the shapes of the objects. So before we store the array pointer, we have to traverse the object graph and then flip the shapes through all of that and make that safe. So, and then after we store that pointer, all the other threads can access these objects safely because by the shapes they know, we have to access them with a little bit of synchronization. But that only affects the ones that are actually blue. And most of the time, we are working on white objects locally. And for those, we don't need any kind of synchronization. OK, good. So we believe we solved the first part of the problem. So now we, have, we can have programs, especially your standard programs, that run with a single thread anyway. You don't have any kind of change in behavior. You don't have any synchronization introduced. Only when you start a second thread, then you may see that there is some small performance degradation. Um, but how we did that, I will leave to the paper. There is a paper on the last slide referenced, if you're interested. So let's look at the arrays. Very similar idea. We use the idea of a strategy here um, to make them also safe for parallel access. So let's run to a little program. Again, a single thread is accessing an array here of three elements. We are going to store, make that array available by storing it, for instance, a global variable so that other threads possibly can compute on that array. And before we do that, we use a write barrier. So these kind of writes to global objects have to have an extra bit of behavior that we have to um, perform before actually the write can happen. And here, we again have to chip, um, switch the shapes around. In that case, the strategy, actually. So, and here I'm going to a strategy that I call um, shared fixed. The idea, in most classic textbooks about parallel algorithms, you will find an algorithm that first initializes some data, loads it from a file or something, and then starts up um, your threads to actually process on that data. That means after originally creating the array, the size of the array rarely changes. So, and here we can really nicely optimize for most of these classic parallel algorithms. Because for accessing any of the indexes of that array in a classic, very static language way, we don't have to do any synchronization. So, um, the problem with that approach is we only can support a limited set of operations. So, in my motivating Ruby example, we actually appended to the array, to the list of numbers. So remember, we created an index where we find stuff in an array. And that was an ever-growing list for each of the buckets. So to support that kind of um, example here in JavaScript notation, if I would do a push to extend that array, I have to do, again, a little bit of extra work. So in that case, we need to, again, change the storage strategy. So And we do that, remember, at that point, because the array is already globally visible and multiple threads can access it, we have to do some more synchronization. We have to prevent any kind of access to that array at that point where we want to change its strategy. So we have a global safe point. There could be some smarter ways of dealing with that, uh, but that's how it works at the moment, just a global synchronization. Simple, but possibly not super efficient. And then, after that or during that synchronization, we change the strategy again. This time, we have a sh shared dynamic strategy. So that shared dynamic strategy adds a specific lock, an extra lock 
to all the excesses. And the idea here is it's not your classic run-of-the-mill read-write lock, for instance. In, instead, it has three different modes of access. So we di distinguish between read-write and layout change. The cool thing here is any kind of read operation, we don't have to actually do any synchronization. For write op um, operations, we only have to check that no other thread is currently in the process of changing the layout. And with layout, I mean, for instance, the size of the array or possibly um, changing the strategy. So for instance, if we would store a double into it, then we would have to change again the strategy, and that counts as a layout change. And only these have to be um, perfectly synchronized. So the reads remain parallel. The writes are mostly parallel. They just check a flag actually local to the thread to minimize the overhead and only um, if there is actually a structural change, a layout change going on, um, they have to, to do a little bit of extra work to synchronize with that. Okay, so to give you a little bit of a bigger picture, um, in Ruby we actually have these five strategies for arrays. So we start out with an empty array, typically, and then depending on how you use the array, we change the strategy around. So here, just as an example, if we would store a long value into the array, so an integer in the range of 64 bits, then we would go to a long um, representation. And if we would then again store an object into that, we would generalize into an object representation. So to add the, um, the parallel dimension, that looks a little bit like that. So for all these representations, we simply replicate them as fixed versions. And that's, as I said before, to support classic parallel algorithms you find in your parallel textbook. And only if we actually do, for instance, um, an append, a delete, or any kind of structural changing operations, then we would go to the shared dynamic strategy. In case we start out empty, we would use that immediately, because the assumption is either you don't access the array, which happens fairly often, uh, and then the performance doesn't even matter. So in many places, people use empty arrays and then never access any index in that. So that's not a performance problem. Uh, otherwise, we expect you to append to that. So at that point, we need that extra bit of synchronization anyway, if multiple threads have already access to it. OK. So there are many other things I could talk about here, uh, just to name a couple of you. Um, so, for instance, for the writing, for the objects, there is a little bit of synchronization going on. So the idea is that we prevent any kind of um, field updates that are lost. We don't want to have any kind of out of thin air values, which is a little bit tricky um, if you think about it. If you change the layout around that another thread starts reading already in parallel, then it could read a value that has been written in that memory before by some other random operation. We don't want that either. Um, all that idea, all these ideas are also applied to dictionaries, which is a little bit more tricky. So I stick with the representation of arrays for the talk. But if you think about dictionaries, especially in Ruby and in JavaScript, you actually have things like insertion order um, that is maintained. So if you iterate over a dictionary, you will get all the elements in the order they have been inserted. So you have to represent that structure as well. How to synchronize that is discussed more in the paper we wrote. Um, yeah. OK. But uh, maybe most interesting for now, let's a little bit look at the performance of that. So here, just to convince you, trying to convince you that we actually avoid any kind of sequential overhead. I took some benchmarks. Um, it's a couple of very classic ones that may be familiar. For instance, Delta Blue, Richards, and there are a couple of modern ones like JSON. Uh, it's generally a small set of smaller benchmarks. They are all single-threaded. They don't have any parallel oper operations. Um, the red part here is the unmodified Truffle Ruby. So all that is built on the Graal VM. Truffle Ruby is our example language that we use. And you see the blue stuff is using our concurrent strategies. It's pretty much uh, minus errors on the same level. So there is no performance impact 
for adding all that extra complexity to your sequential programs. So that means we actually achieved the goal to not um, degrade sequential single core performance. So does it scale? Also favorite question often. Here a couple of very classic parallel benchmarks. So we used the NASA parallel benchmark collection and ported some of these benchmarks. I think it's maybe it's even all of them to Ruby. Um, there was already, just for completeness, a Fortran version. We assumed the Fortran version to be the most optimized. What I show here is actually relative performance. Um, so it's not absolute performance. Ruby is, I think, a factor two, three over the Java performance. The Java performance is a blue one. Um, but here we looked at how do these benchmark scale if you increase the number of cores. And as we can see here, for most of them, these lines m match pretty much. So here's an interesting bug in the Graal just in time compiler. Um, that should be fixed by now, but I didn't rerun the benchmarks. Um, here it actually matched first the performance and then it recompiled something and uh, the resulting native code wasn't as fast. But uh, so other than these kind of glitches, it pretty much, if you write a parallel Ruby program with Truffle Ruby, you get the same kind of scaling um, for classic algorithms as you see for your Fortran programs, for instance, which is pretty cool because then you can just take your textbook, write the program in Ruby, which may be your favorite language or not, and get the kind of parallel speed up you expect. Okay, but of course not everybody implements parallel algorithms, so let's look a little bit at the classic Ruby applications. So what do we have here? Um, Sidekick is a library for running parallel tasks in the background with Ruby. So typically that means you spawn up another Ruby interpreter because you have the global interpreter lock and you don't want um, that to infer, or you don't want to actually reduce, to be reduced to single core performance. Here in that case, we spawn um, just another struct in Ruby. So we have the same kind of parallel bit performance, but without the extra interop cost between Ruby interpreters. So the red line just sums up numbers. So that's the ideal curve we would expect. And then we used, as another example, a library to generate PDF invoices. So assuming generating kind of reports or any kind of um, documents would be something people would likely do. Um, and here we see actually that scales pretty much. So there's a little bit of a difference here. Um, we think that's very likely the garbage collector that then um, just has to tackle much more objects that are generated. So not a perfect scaling. The second set of benchmarks is on the WebRig web framework and um, that just serves a document with Hello World. So from the outside, we request um, just a URL on that. And on MRI, because it has a global interpreter lock, independent of the number of threads, we essentially get a flat line. So that's what you would expect, no parallelism. With classic JRuby, um, we at some point and at 6,000 requests, at about eight threads. And that's also pretty good. And then with our concurrent strategies, uh, we make it until 12,000 requests. So works pretty well. So you can also run a web framework, a web server on that kind of infra infrastructure and get a nice parallel speed up. Richard? How many hardware threads, sorry. How many hardware threads do you have? Um, I believe that was an Oracle machine with, I think, 24 cores. But uh, I would have to look up the paper. Yeah. Okay, good. So the first issue we believe to be solved, no impact on single core performance. With these strategies, we can also get around the need for any kind of application level synchronization. So the example with the buckets and generating a search um, kind of hash map index runs perfectly correct in parallel on our system. And we didn't have to synchronize all accesses to data structures. 
So especially to get the classic parallel algorithms running fast, that works really, really well. Okay, to conclude, um, the basic idea is we split our object heap into blue objects that are a little costly to access depending on how you access them, but they are reachable safely from multiple threads. And for the speed of single core performance, uh, we have the white objects that are still plain, no synchronization whatsoever. In the storage strategy case for our arrays, we add two types of strategies, shared fixed storage and shared dynamic storage. For the fixed storage, as I said, we don't have any synchronization for simple read or write operations. So you get the classic Java memory model. So that means you can actually have race conditions on the content of the array, as you would have in any other parallel language as well, or most of them anyway. Um, but your programs run safe um, from the perspective of not crashing when you, for instance, start doing dynamic things like in Ruby, because then we transition to that shared dynamic strategy where you do that extra bit of synchronization depending on the type of access you have. For reads, we don't need any synchronization. They're optimistically correct. Um, for writes, you need to check a flag. And for larger changes of the layout of the overall structure of the storage, um, you have to have a sequential synchronization. Okay, if you're interested, um, there are a couple of papers detailing all these techniques, including and starting from the global synchronization mechanism we use, um, the lock, the underlying layout lock, and the overall strategies. And that's all I have for you today. Who else got a question? Um, this is a simple one. Uh, so the first time you introduce uh, thread two, a write barrier goes from being a fixed time operation to something that's bounded to the size of the the heap. In worst case, is that a concern of yours or not? So let me bring up that slide. Um, so we are talking here about the point where we have the write barrier. And we may need to traverse larger parts of an object graph. That's what you're concerned about, right? Because we have to, to change around all the object shapes. Yes, that's a concern. And um, if you would have a thread that creates a large graph of objects, you would indeed would have to traverse all that. So there is a trick we haven't actually implemented um, that's also used for other purposes. Mementos in V8. The idea is that you annotate an allocation site with the final shape of an object, for instance. So in the case of our arrays, that would mean the strategy that we use. So here you could feed back information about the final shape um, to the point where objects are allocated. So if you have a pattern where you generate an object graph um, at some point in one single thread, you could know that you already have to initialize them as shared, and then you avoid that extra traversal. For the benchmarks we have, it wasn't a problem, so we didn't actually implement it. But uh, there are ways to kind of avoid that worst-case scenario. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the beginning, you mentioned that um, some dynamic languages have proper parallelism. So how do they compare to this approach? Um, sorry, in the beginning I mentioned there is... You have like a slide with multiple languages. Right. Right. And then you were, say, you were saying the, the ones on the right um, had parallelism because it was proper big... Yeah, yeah, right, because you have less mutation. Right. right. So, is, but, so, so what happens? Do, do they support mutation or...? It depends on the language. So R, it depends what you do in R. So I think there are object models which actually support uh, mutation. Um, so for that, you would need something what I just talked about. Um, for Erlang, you just don't have any mutation. So it's a perfectly functional language. Um, so that's not a problem. Uh, same for Alexia. For Clojure, they have different kind of concurrency abstractions. Um, 
So you have, for instance, a software transactional memory system. So mutation happens on refs, so it's single cells or on atoms. And uh, for that, our approach would not apply. But uh, the idea is that you essentially store functional data structures into these refs and then update the pointer to that in an atomic way. So um, you wouldn't need the complexity I was just talking about. So I was wondering about the situation where you're coloring a number of objects blue. Uh, couldn't you end up in a situation where you have uh, colored a lot of extra objects blue that do not need to be blue anymore in the current heap? Have you considered having some kind of garbage collection that would sort of reassign them uh, such that you might get a uh, more performant version of existing objects that may have been created using a lot of parallelism, but then later on they're only used read-only or something like that? Um, yes, indeed, that's a problem. So maybe to make that point a bit more explicit. So there are different strategies, for instance, for biased locking. Where in the case of a Java object, um, you have for each object actually a lock. And the idea is that only ever if a thread actually uses that lock, if only only ever if multiple threads access that lock, you will actually need a full lock. So if only a single object, if a single thread access an object, you only set a uh, flat uh, bit in the header, I believe. Um, so we over approximate of that. So we have to ch switch shapes around to be safe as soon as a potential is there that multiple threads can access. And that's indeed, again, a problem. Um, so at the moment, we don't have any integration with a garbage collector that could clean up um, the, the uh, shapes to reset them. Um, again, I think that's, that's kind of uh, an engineering thing you probably will need to do, look into once you actually have a code base that writes, has large parallel applications in a dynamic style. Um, and yeah, we haven't seen any of these things because there are just no language implementations that do that stuff. Um, so yes, indeed, I think that's an interesting future research direction uh, once people start writing complex parallel applications in, let's say, Ruby or Python. Um, so I think you, on the results page, you mentioned there was a bug that had been fixed. Uh, but I believe there was also some results on the left where the uh, results were a bit subpar. So I was wondering if you could elaborate on what happened there. Sorry, I didn't catch exactly. Uh, so on the results page, you mentioned there were some results that uh, were caused by a bug that was fixed. Do you um, remember the slide? Which? Uh, the, the evaluation slides. For the parallel benchmarks, or? Uh, I think so. Let me see. So that one. Ah, yes, so you mentioned uh, there was one of the slides where that was caused by a bug. I was wondering, the one on the lower left, uh, you can the one on the lower left? Yeah. The, uh, yes, so I was wondering, is that also uh, the subpar performance, is that also because of a bug, or is that so, like, what's going on there? Um, so, IS, I think IS is integer sorting. So you, you're asking why that curve doesn't match exactly? Yes. Um, no, we haven't looked into that. And I would be lying to you if I would make something up here. So no, I don't, I don't know. Sorry. So um, I would be curious in the implementation efforts. So it seems that once you have storage strategies, probably most of this is local changes to the strategies. So I would guess most of the efforts would be to introduce storage strategies into Mats Ruby? Unfortunately not. No, it's quite a lot of engineering. Um, so the problem is there is a lot of interaction between multiple parts of the language implementation here. Um, one, one key problem is the situation that you have code calling out to Ruby code again. So things like operations that take closures, um, blocks in Ruby. Um, so there the implementation becomes fairly hairy. And in the, in the paper, I believe we, we discussed a couple of these operations. For some of them, you can take shortcuts and have the implementation nice and easy um, because you assume 
that they, for instance, don't access the second array. So because you can do anything in a block, um, so you kind of have to coordinate uh, accesses between multiple arrays. And that means you actually have to change quite a bit um, of seemingly unrelated bits of the language implementation to um, fit your assumptions about synchronization order and uh, access um, to other kind of objects around. The other thing is um, we had to change the object model as well. So we started with the object model, so it's not just the storage strategies. Um, and then you have to think about um, all the built-in operations uh, that are implemented. So in the case of Truffle implementations in Java, and then they have to do the right thing to access uh, the objects as well. So sometimes you have fairly complex operations. Same is true for build-in operations for, for arrays. Um, so you have, ideally, in a perfect world, just to fiddle with a storage strategy implementation, yes. But in, in the practical world, you have a whole bunch of other places and built-in functions to consider as well. Which adds engineering uh, effort quite a bit.